Good afternoon, early riser. It's so nice to see you today in the midst of a the first like substantial significant snowstorm for New York City. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep, for the year. Are you a fan of those snowy days or are you wishing it was August right now? No, I'm a big fan. I I hate uh, warm summer and I always say that like one of the reasons why people just seem to not really care about global warming is because everybody likes it warm, uh, except me. Um, and if it was global colding, we would have had it fixed like, you know, a generation ago, but like global warming people get like kind of upset, but then uh, not really because they love having 80 degree weather in January, you know, but yeah, so, anyway, I love it. I think that's so insightful. I can't believe I have, like, we haven't thought about that more intentionally. Like, that is yeah, so it, it falls into people's comfort zone you know it's it's so for most people like i said it's kind of like people don't like the cold weather so it the idea that things are getting warmer doesn't really bother them you know but so anyway, i love the cold winter, winter is my favorite season actually so very cool i hope that you get to soak it all up today however you like to do that and i'm so appreciative that you're taking some time in your weekend to speak with me um for those who do not know you this is early riser artist based in new york city i really look forward to understanding your story a bit more today these different areas that you play in from you know um like street art to directing and acting and, and all the stuff so um before we go into that present i love to start with understanding the person when they were growing up. So early riser, you know, where were you? What were you like as a kid? When did you start realizing that this, you know, creative space was really gonna be something you made your own? Um, well, to answer the second part, I mean, I don't think I had like one epiphany moment because art and creativity have just really always been with me for pretty much as long as I could remember. I mean, I can't really, I can't really think of a time that I wasn't creating art. I mean, you know, going back to my earliest memories, they were of producing art and, and you know, creating in other ways. So, I mean, I was already active and, you know, producing what I call, you know, like, I mean, I was already using the term artist, like to describe myself by the time I was five or six years old, but I was certainly creating even prior to that. Um, I grew up in New York, New York City. I was born in New York City. Um, so I grew up here, um, I went to high school on Long Island and I don't know, there isn't much to be said that kind of about that experience. I think that hasn't already been said a million times, it, you know? Yeah. Um, I remember when we were getting to know each other, you were talking about, um, your mom and her like coming to school to get shown your artwork and also that she paid for art supplies for you. And that was really important with how you grew up. Can you explain a little bit about you, maybe your family values or what that meant that your mom did that for you? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's interesting because my mom always valued hard work. She still does. She was always very proud of the fact that her father, my, my grandfather charged them, charged her all the kids rent after they, turned 16 in order to live in the house. And so the expectation was that once you reached an age, you would be, you know, contributor to the household. And so she carried those things down to myself um, and my siblings as well. And so there's an expectation that we would get gainfully employed and that would essentially, you know, provide any of the non-essential things. She wasn't charging us rent and food was obviously covered, but pretty much by the age of 16, anything else that we wanted, I think there was like, you know, I think she would cover the basics of clothes, but beyond that, it was pretty much on us and anything, and certainly I think anything special. And we were just, we were absolutely expected to work. And if we didn't work, we couldn't continue to live there basically. And, um, uh, but the the one the one uh, caveat to that was art supplies that I think uh, it's not that I wasn't necessarily expected to contribute if I could, but there was never art, an art supply that I might have needed that if I couldn't afford it with my part time job that you know we wouldn't she wouldn't find a way to 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 get for me and that extended through to college, you know you would when. Um, 
in art, you know, you get your syllabus and in art school, the syllabus is listing all the art supplies you need. So you show, it's just like books, you know, but you show up at the, the art store with a big list and, you know, it could easily be a thousand dollars worth of art supplies or more. And that was, again, an area where um, it was something that my mother put a great deal of value in early on um, to develop my ability. And so I think in much the same way as you might, you know, do anything you could to, um, to buy somebody who had a lot of, uh, who showed a lot of promise in reading and, you know, as a writer or something, you might buy them whatever books they needed or something like that. Um, but for this, it was, it was art supplies for me. So. Yeah. Um, I think that that investment yeah, I, early on was so beautiful. Yeah, and I don't think I was asking for outrageously expensive things. And of course, most of this was pretty much pre-digital art age. And so it was more traditional art supplies, but again, they still can get quite expensive. I remember this one marker set that I wanted that well, at the time was seemed like very expensive. I don't really remember how much, but it maybe like several hundred dollars even back in the eighties. And um, she even found a way to get me that, although I think it took like, it was, it ended up being a Christmas present. So it wasn't just like, oh, here, you want this, you can, but it was, so we had to kind of like be a special thing. And I, I know, remember waiting for it for, you know, like well over a year wanting this, but eventually, I, you know, I got this like kind of full artist grade marker set, um, which I made great use of once I had, but anyway. Yeah, I think that um, even, you know, the anticipation or the, the patience of waiting for it, it just kind of added to that value. Once you had it, this became this really important part of your, your story almost. But, you know, there's something else to that too, which was that you also, that, did that marker set particularly, this is a little off topic, but taught me kind of a really valuable lesson too about art supplies, because as an artist, you get very like, um, you know, get excited by, uh, anything that seems like it could be a muse or, you know, so like you go into the art store and everything looks like so dazzling and beautiful and you really want it all. And so like this massive marker set of like, the, there are two elements of it. The first was that I was an artist quality blendable marker, but the second was that it pretty much was like every color, every shade, you know? And the funny thing is, is that I ended up only using a core of those and I used them up and then the rest kind of, I really never used and then they just dried up because they were in colors in the palette that I was really interested in working in. So, and even to this day, I mean, I, I work with a very restricted palette. And so one of the things that did teach me just because you have access to everything under the sun in terms of a color, uh, that doesn't mean that all that stuff's kind of useful to you in terms of getting across the expression you want. So, you know, from a practical and financial standpoint, you know, it helps to really think about exactly what it is you really will be using. And so to the, this day, I really have a very narrow palette. I know exactly what colors at this point that I use. I, I keep, I buy them, I keep them all in stock for the various different media, but I never really you know, I know what colors I don't use. I don't just think to myself, maybe I'll buy this one day because um, I mean, there, there are exceptions of course, but as a general rule, it's sort of like, I recognize that anything outside of what I've become sort of, you know, uh, aware is sort of my, my palette. Uh, I, I don't just pick it up because it has to be a more mindful thing, you know. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, I think that's so wise. <laughs> I think and see how yeah. that will carry through from the way that you were, were raised to be making wise investments, to be <laughs> thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, the value of the things that you do pursue. Um, so that's really beautiful. And I don't want to miss, um, so I you imagine you had some different part-time jobs. You mentioned, you know, that you'd been working from your teenagers. Were there mm -hmm. any that were kind of um, funny or stood out or really important to you? I know I had a seasonal job at Bath and Body Works one year in college. And like, that was a really memorable experience. Um, I, I have I have had so many crazy jobs that people think I, I'm lying about them almost. Um, I, for the longest time, my main job that I got when I, when I needed a job and I got long before age 16, um, I think I was 14 when I got the job was uh, on a commercial fishing boat. And I did that um, pretty much every summer until I graduated college. So 
um, that was a really formative experience. It's hard work, you know, obviously it's predominantly male. And so you're dealing with those kinds of egos and personalities and things. And, um, but it was great money. And, you know, I learned a lot about, you know, being on a boat, about, you know, fishing, about commercial fishing, about fixing boats. Because when you're doing that, like eventually I became the first mate. And so then it's really like you're second in command of the boat. And so, you know, I remember one time we started taking, it was like a very bad storm that rolled through. We started taking on water and it was like a big, but like, you know, so like while the, the captain was sort of piloting the boat, all the responsibility for the safety of everybody on board and also trying to get the water out from, you know, the bilge pumps had stopped working. And so I was down there trying to like, get the pumps going again and simultaneously making sure that like the crew were getting everybody to done life, uh, life, uh, that, um, life preservers. And like, so that was, you know, that was a very formative experience for like a 17, 18 year old to be um, doing. So yes. that was one, one crazy job. I, I DJed for the longest time too, um, through college um, at parties, at clubs, um, clubs later after I was old enough to be in clubs. And then the other, the other crazy thing I did was um, do, this was more, it fell in more with the art, but uh, the DJing and the clubs eventually led to me doing body art in the bathroom of Limelight. Um, no. Here in the city. Okay, wait, this is really cool because my mom dated the owner of Limelight for a long oh, time. Peter, She's Peter in, Gation? I think so, yeah. Ooh. Wow, yeah, so. I mean, those were the days back then. I mean, I knew, I, I, you know, knew him, you know, as much as any other employee there would, but I, I didn't really work for him directly, but I, I sort of like struck a deal with them whereby I would give them a percentage of the money I earned. And I just set up shop in one of the bathrooms in Limelight, in the chapel bathroom to be exact, and did body art on people, anybody that wanted it. And they would essentially pay me to do it. And it got pretty crazy, you know, the things people asking for varying degrees of total like nudity and all their other crazy stuff that happens in clubs uh, in the bathrooms. And um, yeah, it was nuts. I mean, I remember one day like, like Sting was there and like, it was like, and Prince was there one day too, actually. And like, uh, and then the club kids, I was doing the club kids scene. So like, the funny thing was, is I revised, I, re, um, uh, I, I revisited that whole thing later, maybe about 10 years after it, there was a film called Party Monster and the head makeup artist contacted me to ask if I could provide the, the body, the inks that we were using um, to kind of recreate the thing. So, uh, so I got to kind of reprise the whole body art thing. Uh, uh, the the head makeup artist who was um, Kiyoki, um, I believe Kiyoki, um, did the actual art that time. I didn't do it, but I provided them with all of the original colors and um, the the actual inks I was using to do it. And so I'm credited at the end of um, Party Monster, if you ever watched that. Oh movie. my gosh, that's so wild. What an amazing... Oh, okay. I, mean, I wouldn't recommend watching it actually because it's an <laughs> awful movie, but. You know. But to be inserted in that moment in, in history and in New York City nightlife, I'm just, I think that's so. Um, it was interesting and it was really fun. And, you know, the funny thing about that is that eventually we took that out to what we were like, me, I was, it was like me and a friend were making such good money doing that, that like, I only had to do that two nights a week and, and I had my rent paid. And, um, so then I started the idea of doing it at street fairs, which aren't as big now as they used to be, but they used to be huge. And there was a street fair pretty much every weekend at somewhere in the city. And so we would go and do it like at the street fair during the day and then go to the, the club like two nights a week. And not, not usually Saturday, probably or Saturday night actually, because it was just too busy, but more like off night. We did it during Disco, uh, Disco 2000 night, which was a Wednesday, I think remember I think I 
it, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a Wednesday. Oh. And then the other, the other night, I think it was a weeknight also. I don't remember what day it was though. Um, but then I'm like, we would do the, the, the street art, um, the, and uh, I mean the art, the, the body art at street fairs. So that was like my first real taste of being on the street during art. You're just out there painting people's bodies on the street, essentially. We have a tent, you know, but it wasn't, it was, you know, so. Ah, who would have known, right, that your work would continue to evolve in the streets in some way. That's really amazing. And I'd like to understand more. So there was this moment in time where you were doing the body art um, in the lavatories. How did this overlap or did it like where in the timeline was this versus when you went to school to study studio art and mixed media? It was after. That was after I'd already graduated. It was like a couple of years after. I, I don't remember exactly, but I was probably out of school two, three years, I'd say. I was still, I was really young. I mean, I graduated um, a little younger than other people. So I think I had just turned 21 when I graduated art school. And then so I was probably like 23 or 24 years old then. So it was kind of crazy, wild, fun time. And you wouldn't even believe like some of the stories. I mean, one time we got invited to do an after party to come to somebody's house out in Jersey and they were paid some obscene amount of money in cash for me and my friend to go out there. And when we got there, it was actually an or like a like a straight up orgy. Like the person that answered the door was their nanny, but she was like in full bondage gear. It was oh just a, another story for another day. But um, and all sorts of crazy propositions from you know, I mean, of the sexual variety almost always. But it was like constantly fending off these like. It was a very wild scene. It really, really was. So those early years on the ship were good preparation for just holding your own, I feel like, in whatever circumstance. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Because the guys on the ship, the boat too, uh, we don't really call it a, a ship because it was a little too small for that. It was like 115, 120 feet. Um, but they were pretty rough with me. I mean, towards the later years, I had kind of earned respect. But in the early days, they were, they were really brutal. They would... Um, they would haze me mercilessly. So I think that's right. I think that it, it really did um, kind of teach me to sort of stand up for it. And that carries through now for like street art and stuff and people come up and talk to you and, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, I know what I'm in for. I know what to, <laughs> I'm protected by, by myself. So that's yeah. awesome. And I think, you know, so many points in your story now, I can see where maybe your style was evolving, your color choices were evolving, your different motivations. Um, it's a good segue into really what your style is and approach to work. I think I've heard you mention it as an intersection between classic street and pop art. You mentioned just now like a refined palette that you go to. Can you yeah. speak to kind of a little bit about those things? Uh, yeah, well, I think, you know, I mean, I, I don't find that like my art fits super neatly into like a category or a movement, although it kind of makes me think maybe we need to find a new name, but I, I think it's sort of most heavily influenced by the pop art. So I sort of use that just because I think people, most people know what that is, or at least they have some idea, but very heavily influenced by the uh, neo-expressionists uh, also. And um, so, you know, in both cases, you're dealing with sort of, um, you know, often kind of reduced elements um, and bold colors because you're, you're trying to convey a message pretty pretty quickly. So, you know, the pop artists are, are taking, you know, uh, a lot of the, the material from, you know, initially from the advertising world. And it's all there. It's all about how to get people's attention, grab it, and uh, in a very quick way. Um, you know, the pop artists have go even further that they say that the, the, that selling itself is a form of art and uh, almost separate from the actual images, which is an interesting concept. Um, but that, that's where my art diverges a little from my pop art. But I think the aesthetic is very similar. And that's why the, the, the you know, my color, my color choice has always gravitated towards that, but it's never been a conscious decision. Like I want to do this because I think it'll grab people's attention more quickly, but more that the pop artists have always spoken with me because there's something about bold and bold colors that are um, you know, a fairly narrow palette that has always spoken to me. And I don't, I don't know, 
I don't really know why that is. I think there's probably a lot of reasons, but I find that boldness of color, um, for me at least, seems the most emotive. You know, and I've always been interested also, even with form, of how can we reduce form, like how few lines can I use and get something to emote, you know, like in this image here, for instance, you know, like, you know, how, like, how few lines can I, like, can I use to, to, to convey some expression in this figure? Um, that's always fascinated me because when we like really zoom out and maybe get out of focus a little bit and really crank the contrast up, even on some like a photograph of somebody's face, you're left with these basic elements, but you could still recognize that it's a face, you know, or you can usually tell their emotion. So I'm very interested in that. And I think that that kind of starts to boil down to like the essence of the visual portrayal of an emotion, you know, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with like, um, you know, some fine details, but has much more to do with the bony, the way the light catches on a bony structure, but there's some very fine, I'm always trying to figure out what is the single or just couple hallmarks that let you um, know what, you know, what the emotion is. And the, the example with text is that like um, fonts, uh, for instance, is the reason why we have um, serif fonts and they're more useful than sans serif fonts in some regard is that you can cover half of a serif letter and you could still tell what the letter is because the hooks make, they give you um, enough of a, well, like a hook. So you can kind of, um, you can read it more easily. So um, the upside to serif fonts is that they give you some visual cues that allow you to read letters even with uh, a loss of significant visual uh, detail. Whereas ser sans serif, you can't. So like Helvetica, if you cover up a significant portion, you can't read it. Mm -hmm. um, but sir, they, so, um, so I'm always wondering like, what is the, like how can we boil down the essence of an emotion? Like what's it most pure form of an emotion? And like, what's the visual version of that? Or like, you know, I, there's a thing called synesthesia where people hear a sound, uh, but instead of actually hearing it, they, um, they see a color. Like, so you would play a note, but um, you, these, these people that have this would actually see a color. And so, or sometimes it's it's related to like numbers. So people will, you know, you hear the number eight and you might think of an eight, but they would hear the number eight and actually see a color. So it's like, well, what color is the number eight? Like what, what color is eight? Like, is there an inherent color that eight is? Like is eight the same color for everybody all the time? And, or is the, like, is the emotion of sadness, is, like if is the emotion of sadness mixed with worry, but also optimism, if you swirl this up, is it the same color every time? You know, like these are the things I'm thinking about. And so it always ends up being very bold and frequently very few colors. I'm probably getting a little in the weeds in my description. I love the weeds are my favorite place um, to be. <laughs> um, I think that that's such a, a cool insight into your work and how you approach it and that um, desire to communicate on this different level, um, I, I'm sure, um, is so satisfying to see when people do respond to it or come up with ideas about what's going on there. Um, that's well, awesome. you know, the interesting thing too is now everything is like, it's like you you make this big. I mean, this is like three feet by four feet, I think. But then 99% of everybody who's ever going to see this is going to see it on a, a you know a screen this big on Instagram. Yeah. So. Like, I don't know how they, I, you know, it's really hard to know. So like this one, uh, this painting in particular, I decided to try something new, which is I really wanted to get a sense of like, more than just like thumbs up, I love it. Like, I really actually wanna know, like, what does this make you feel? Like, I wanna critique. So I'm, I put this up there and I was like, I will give you this painting. Like this painting is going to be free and given to somebody. Uh, just leave me an honest, and thoughtful critique about your about the art, what it makes you feel, anything that comes to mind. And I'm I'm going to gather all those up, and I'm going to put them in a bowl, and I'm going to pick one, and um, and then you get this painting. And I'm going to try to do that a few times because I really, really want people to. I want to know what like, you know, what they're feeling, what their reaction is, and more often than not, with Instagram, it's like they think I'm just looking for 
like some congratulations. Like, I love that. Like, I mean, that's nice. And I appreciate that. Uh, and I really do appreciate that. But um, like as an artist, I, that doesn't really tell me if I was successful or not, because success to me isn't like, you're telling me what you think I want to hear, like, good job, or that's great. Like, uh, success is, did I make you feel the, did I convey the, the, the emotion that I was trying to convey? Yeah. Or did you feel something different? But now that I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's actually hiding in there too. And I was feeling that way when I painted it and I wasn't even thinking about that. But, so I really want to get to the bottom of that. So I'm going to start to do this every once in a while where I'll just give away paintings just so I could try to get what people are feeling when they look at the art. Wow, that's going to be so, um, I think, powerful and um, and fun and, and also empowering for that audience to believe, to start to believe that, like, okay, I can read into this too. Like, I can yeah. extract from someone's subconscious something that's actually helpful for the artist too. Um, what a nice way to get to have, like, a real back and forth. Um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, you know, the other thing is that I think, um, you know, the way we consume art has become so commoditized because again, Instagram, it's been a wonderful tool in that you can reach so many people, but it's also sort of commoditized and people, the amount of times people spend is so limited. Um, so to get people to re-engage, this is not some quick little um, clickbait content that this is an actual piece of art and that, uh, you know, to like recognize and to consume that way and so the more people who can have exposure to the original piece, the better. So like that's the other, the benefit of like eventually giving like this exists in the real world. And so the idea that you can actually win it, it does two things. It sends them out like, no, this is an actual thing that is you can touch. Right. And then also at least one person is going to get to experience it in, in the real world. And I think that their experience with it is going to is going to be usually when people receive a painting after after they've just seen a small picture of it, their experience is like, oh my God, you know, and it's like the, and so the more people I can reach that way. And you know, a lot of times if a painting doesn't sell right away, it it doesn't sell ever because, you know, it, unless I show it again, but usually if I don't show it again, it just eventually sits in my uh in my storage, you know, and I have hundreds of paintings in my storage that didn't sell, you know, in the first year that I painted it. So it doesn't bother me to give some away that might have just ended up in storage anyway, especially if it, you know, increases engagement and also um, my enjoyment in, in, in doing it. And, you know, so. That's awesome. I, I really appreciate how intentional you are about that online space. I think I, I find myself thinking a lot about um, Instagram, especially like, why am I showing up here? Like, what does my showing up here mean? Like, how is it going to actually um, impact another person? And so um, hearing you describe these different layers of your thought process is very helpful. And I am thankful for it. Um, when we were getting to know each other, you talked about you know, photography also being part of your process of making. And I wondered if you could elaborate on that here. Yes, I can. I'm going to show you the key tool that I use, which I can leave on, leave the camera going. Sure. So this this is one of my one of the tools I use as much as just about anything else. My beloved Fuji. This is an XD4, but I love Fuji film. You know, a lot of people like other things, Sony or Canon, but I love Fuji because Fuji is a very nuanced. Uh, I don't know. It's like a little bit of the the the. Um, uh, it's not an ugly duckling, but it's like the, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of the underdog, but um, they have such a wonderful color um, um, uh, formula that they, they bring out these really warm, vivid things. Anyway, so yes, I compose on really uh, almost all of my work. I would say this piece I did not compose with uh, this, this kind of free form style, which is really just like an illustration that's blown up. Uh, this I just do without any, it's just based on what's in my mind. But generally speaking, most stuff like, um, I think like this behind me. So that, that starts as a photo. And actually you can kind of see, if you, you know, this is, you can see the original. Yes. So I, comp I compose everything with photography. Um, 
for a few different reasons. First, I, um, you know, photography is an amazing tool because it allows you to capture, see, so how can I best explain it? So if, you, if I was to sit here and sketch you, first of all, it takes time and then people move around and I don't capture it exactly the way I want it necessarily, which is, which is totally fine. But I love the idea of being able to kind of compose something just the way I want it and then capture it like that, you know, exactly. Like for me, I want it to be composed when I'm, when I'm working this way, I like to compose it in the real world exactly as is. So, and then I capture it on film. And then from there, I can then, I can turn it into any, I can use it as film. I can turn it into any image I want. It's sort of like, you know, the, the, the other way to, to work, you know, would be to sort of take a general bunch of pictures and then merge them. To me, that's a, that's a different way to work with, with uh, photography, but that's much more of like a, like an inspirational kind of thing. And then the, the, the traditional way of just sitting there sketching. But what I love about sort of staging it is that it's like, um, again, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm producing this in, in the actual real world and I can look at it from so many different angles and I can get it just the way I want it. And I liken it to sort of like, you know, filming something for real, like an action sequence for real versus doing it all in post and CGI. It's like, they're, they both have their merits, but I, I like to do it in the real world. I'd much rather like plan out a very complex action scene and then film it than to, than to try to do it all in post. And, and so I'd much rather lay out my, my whole piece in the real world, compose it, the the people, you know, the, the the subjects where I want them to be, the backgrounds how I want them to be, everything, and then captured on film. And then the funny thing is, is from that, that's the most realistic rendering that I ever have. Because again, I don't, I can, my early work was very realistic, but I really move away from that now because I don't need to work realistically because the camera does that for me. So what that does is it kind of is like saving your original whatever, spreadsheet or anything. Like you saved your original, it's there, it's the archive. I can always go look back on that moment in time. And then from there, I've got this anchor point and I could, I could pivot on that anchor any way I wanna go. It can end up looking so completely different from the original and, you know, yet, um, I mean, if I had prepared, I could have showed you some examples, but um, I, you know, so that's just, I, I like to work that way because it allows me to kind of compose things and life is sort of this like life example, but then it, and it gives me a sort of firm anchor from which I could then, I can just like orbit as wildly as I want to do. And uh, I also, the second thing about composing with photography is I can really get I really am interested in like in angles of viewing as again a way to help um, express emotion, and I think it's much easier to do with the camera than it is to do. Like if I want to take an like an angle, like a lot of my shots will be shooting up like this. If I was to do, even this one, which is kind of to really like if I was to sit there and try to sketch this out first, I'd have to be kind of like down here, you know, like yeah. like and yeah, and it's like you know, it's very difficult, frankly. And I, I, a lot of times on the camera, I will affix a monopod on the top and then I'll like, I'll drop the camera down around my feet and I can like point it up. I can do anything I want. I can bring it to the side, hold it out here. I have a remote shutter release. So I can really capture all different, like it's, I can help me to understand the world. Like, I mean, I'll be shooting pictures up here all over the place with this thing on the monopod and I can really understand the context of that particular moment in time in ways that I was would never have been able to if I was just sitting in it. I mean, I'm immersed in the, in this situation because I'm there, and I'm also now getting almost this like fourth dimension view by having this camera all around, you know. So um, I just find that it opens up a lot of doors that are interesting for me, and then. Again, I take it, I don't take it and then just reproduce it faithfully. I take that and use that as sort of like, a, you know, 
almost like if you're trying to make a, you know, circles and like that, like the pin in the center, like that's my stable point. I can always refer back to it, but from there I can just kind of do anything I want. Or maybe like, remember those spirographs? Yes. Like that. <laughs> that's so cool. It sounds like it is um, a liberating tool that allows you to be in this space in less constricting ways. And I'm also thinking that, you know, um, like I love a to-do list, right? Cause I don't have to remember the minutia of life in my exactly. head. Yes, yeah. right? so the camera, it sounds like is like, it's capturing the literal for you. So I don't have to worry about right. where the car was exactly. That's beautiful. That's a great way to put it. It's capturing the literal for me. And I'm not that interested in the literal. I'm not, you know, again, I think I don't, um, I have an utmost level of respect for people that do produce art in a completely realistic fashion. Um, my my take on that though is like, I'm not interested in doing that because the camera does it better than I could ever do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I'd much rather use it as this tool to, to help me capture the literal that then I can add the emotion that the camera just can't do. You know, someday if the camera can do this, then I guess I'm gonna have to find a new thing to add, you know? Yeah, I don't, I think we're good for, for a long time, but um, oh. I, I really enjoyed also listening to how you were describing maybe like the staging and things like that. And those are pretty, from my I, lack of knowledge, like theatrical terms, right? And you are also in the acting space mm -hmm. and directing space. Can you speak to how those worlds kind of collide yeah. or what that's like? I mean, that's a really good insight because I do tend to, so what's also interesting is I don't think in still and still images, I think in terms of scenes, almost always, and I imagine the before and the after and the during, and like in this, this you know, example here, I mean, I have a whole sort of sequence of events that have occurred before and during, and what's happening at this moment, as though it's a scene in a movie, and that helps me to give a, get a window into like what the, the subject's experience is at that moment, like what's going on in her head at that exact moment, um, and then, so when I approach the painting of it, I have this sort of, um, this whole plot, if you will, that kind of I'm, I'm imagining that kind of feeds into it. So it's not just this like one or two dimensional sense of an emotion, but there's a whole backstory and forest story going into it in my mind. People always joke that I'm always coming up with these crazy, complicated um, storylines for things. And I always, so I'm always, I'm always imagining things in, in terms of scenes and storylines. All my art, even though it's still, uh, I'm imagining it as though it's just a still shot in the whole series as though you're looking at a, a roll of, of video film and uh, it, as you just took one of the stills out, that would be like this, you know? Wow. And so that's the intersection. That's an interesting insight because I never really thought about it, but I, I never picture things in my mind as a still, as a still life. I'm, oh, I always picture it as an event. And all I'm doing is going in and grabbing it quick. And again, that gets back to like snapping a bajillion pictures. It's almost like I'm basically rolling film, you know? And trying to capture like the little almost like you're trying to capture you know like back in the the romantic era where people thought they could capture a picture of like a fairy in there or something and like you're almost trying to capture the stuff that you can't really experience in the real life you know yeah um, well, that's so cool and i am like as i look at the the work that is behind you i'm thinking about like what is this person's day looking like where are they going what's in their head and um i could picture a whole movie unraveling um yeah from there, which is awesome. And I, and I think one of the things that I'm trying to do is like, while I have a sense of like what emotions I'm trying to bring forward, the main point is to help people to emote, emote something. And I think um, I'm always flattered when people um, take from the, the art um, something that's meaningful to them and they imagine a scene or a scenario, but it's completely different than what I had envisioned, but it's no less meaningful to me. So it's sort of like you read a book and you get one take about it and then somebody else reads it and it's like a completely different, you just have to like blows my mind like, whoa, I never even saw that. And then I can't help but think like, maybe that was in there. I must've baked that in there too, if you will. And I just didn't realize, you know, it's yeah. sort of like, you know, if you use the same cutting board for 
lots of different things. And sometimes, you know, you can kind of taste garlic in your brownies and, um, <laughs> and people point that out to you when you're like, you know, now that you mention it, yeah, I could see this whole other, you know, like whole other set of circumstances and it has nothing to do with what I was originally thinking, but it, it also, and the main thing is, is that they, like it reached them on that level. Yes, I love that. I also, um, I love brownies with weird ingredients and in I'm a big black bean brownie person. So now oh, yeah. I'm hungry, but it's- Yeah, I don't know about garlic brownies, but that was just- That one would be a different, food. yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things I love to put, my, my dad used to always get angry whenever I would do it. I would like to put in pancakes and also in brownies, just a teeny sprinkle of cayenne pepper, um, which gives it this really interesting little zing, not too much, just a little hint. Um, it really works well, but that's a little bit of a side point. My dad would always be like, why are you messing up my pancakes? <laughs> that's wild. I'm on a pancake kick right now. So I might have to add a little cayenne and let you know. It's a tiny pinch. Yeah, it really works. It really is cool. delicious. Um, so I'm wondering about these, you mentioned, you know, coming up with these scenes in your head and they become sort of stills in your art. Are these scenes something that come up in your subconscious throughout your life? Are you is there a place you sit in your apartment where these ideas come to you? Like, how aware are you of the formation of these scenes that ultimately become your work? Oh, sort of constantly. Like, where I mean, if they happen just all the time. Um, like, I see things, and when I see something, it just it just triggers this like this little mini scene in my head. Like, I mean, it happens hundreds of times a day. Some of them are not that interesting. Others, I'll see somebody walking along the street and it's almost instantaneously as though we're watching it in a movie, you know, and with a whole storyline to it. And I'll just, that happens. And it just happened to me right before we got on uh, with somebody pushing through a turnstile and like the way they pushed through, it just had this like, this theatrical kind of vibe to it. And I, I just immediately imagined like a whole story attached to it. But it's not even like I'm going to imagine a story. It just instantly happens. And it happens to me, like I said, hundreds of times a day. And uh, most, of them, most of them are just little teeny snippets, but some of them are more well-formed. And um, those are the ones I tend to elaborate on. I feel like that's such a gift to be kind of like attuned to the poeticism almost of life and of motion. And that is, uh, so maybe it's distracting, but also. It can occur, occur simultaneously because a lot yeah. of times, you know, you're, it, I mean, most of life's stories are not happy stories. So, I mean, you know, so it's, I feel like you're constantly watching these movies where somebody is, I mean, you know, not living the best day of their life um, or, you know, or just like the monotony of life, like the tree. We look at the look in the eyes of the uh, the train conductors, and like some of them, you know, the, I don't know. It's all an adventure thing. Like I I think about like you know them coming home at the end of the night and talking about their day, and then like, and you're like this is what's in my mind all the time. So you know, if I decide to like paint them, if I ever like snap a picture of one and paint them, I'm imagining like them going home to their house somewhere in Queens and like you know, they get into a fight with their teenage son about something, but they're just so tired. And I, you know, like I could just, this whole thing. Wow. Oh. There's a lot of weight to that though. It's not just like this happy stoicism. I mean, sometimes it could be that, but more often than not, it's got to, like, I'm more interested in like the sort of the real, like what happens in most people's real lives, which, you know, again, I think is a reaction in part to like everything that people show to each other now is mostly filtered through uh, social media. And it's like, people are showing this like fake version of themselves, you know, and it contributes to everybody else's unhappiness because um, nobody is ever like, you know, they're like, they're like, they're arm in arm with like the, the perfect, you know, perfect husband, gorgeous, like successful lawyer and this and that. And she's like, but she's never like, and you know, the caption is never like, he beats me, you know, like he gets drunk every night and beats the hell out of me. You know, it's like, it's always this like snapshot that like leads people to believe that things are amazing in your life 100% of the time. And everybody else reads that and thinks, how come my life is such crap? And my husband drinks too much and is sleeping with his, you know, best friend. And my other friend is just having this amazing life, you know? And so, I'm not interested in portraying this like 
altered reality. I want to show like what our real lives are like because our, for one thing, it's more interesting. And for another, I think it will bring, it brings people more comfort to see themselves, what they're going through reflected in other people's experiences. Yeah, I think that that resonates a lot. I, you know, we work in mental health. I'm learning to be a social worker. And um, we think often about um, if you make the real life taboo and the glamorized life normal, like that is going to be so disruptive for people's ability to function. 100%. Yeah. Because it's okay to not, I mean, it's, it's the majority of the time we're not going to be on cloud nine, right? Those are those blips of moments, maybe if we're lucky. Um, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and I mean, like, the thing is, too, like, with Instagram, for instance, you're just snapping pictures. I mean, you're not seeing the before, the after, the even the during. If I snap, you could, the, I mean, I could, you could see somebody, like, I mean, you see it all the time with celebrities, right? Like, some, some night, you'll see the photo of them on the red carpet, and they look glamorous, and they're, like, you know, beautiful, and they look like they've got the perfect, you know, person on their arm, but then you read later in the tabloids that that later that night, they, like, got into this drunken fight on the elevator, and he punched her in the face five times and broke her jaw, you know, and, like, so there's two realities there, but one is, you know, one is a much more real reality and the other is just like a stage snapshot of a, of a, it, it was, it was built to look perfect, you know, it would be as though we're all taking like Barbie doll and holding it in front of the camera and pretending like that's us for real, or it's really no different than like running these filters that make us look better than we really are. Yeah. You know, once one person does that, everybody else starts like, why does she look so refreshed and happy? And I look so tired and I have these wrinkles. So then you have to do it. And then that, you know, it just becomes this thing. And it's like, yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a modern version of like keeping up with the Joneses. Like if the, you know, the person next door to you has a BMW and like seems to have it all, the kids are doing great in school. Then you feel like crap unless you have that stuff. And Yeah. So um, I, I think it's, um, it's like almost like this burden or this responsibility that you get to see real life. You have all these ideas of what's going on in it. And then you put it on the canvas or on whatever medium you're using. When the work is done, how do you feel? Does it feel like, okay, you can release it because now it lives there? Does it feel like, you know, satisfying, frustrating? What goes through your head? That's a good question. I think it's sometimes yes, sometimes, sometimes no, but more often than not, I think the emotions are too big or the feelings are too big to really get out in one shot. Like this, this painting is like something that it's like the same kind of frustration that just, I, it's, I don't know how many paintings it's going to take before I can really work it all out, but this is called brother's keeper. And it's this idea that like, we seems like a simple concept, but we're losing sight of the fact that, um, we can only exist on the planet when we help each other. Like we can't, you know, we can't exist alone. And so, you know, but we see it over and over and over again with this selfish intent around like, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask and it's my right not to, or I have the right to, you know, any kind of weaponry I want and who cares what you think or, or, in you know another context, I I'm going to drive 95 miles down Broadway, when, you know, because because I want to, you know, and then without any regard for the consequences or for what that does to the other people driving 95 miles an hour in your loud whatever car, you know, the quality of life of the people there, the potential of hitting somebody you know, the, the masks, obviously, they're all basically decisions that people arrived at without any, any care for anybody else, essentially. And like, humans cannot survive that way. Like, we're not, like, we're not capable of doing that. And the truth is, is that we all need each other. And I was thinking a lot about like how people forget that until we do, until we need each other, you know? It's like people are all, you know, anti-vax and anti-mask until they get COVID and then they turn up at the hospital uh, sick 
exposing, I mean, I had a, a friend who was a nurse who passed away from COVID. And, you know, I, I had this vision of somebody, and I've, I, she told me the story many times before she died of people that knew they had been exposed and they knew they had symptoms and they showed up anywhere and refused, anyway, and refused to wear a mask and exposed her, you know? And like, that is like the most selfish thing that anybody could possibly do. And, 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 and then yet they expected you to do everything possible to save them, to fix them, to cure them. Um, and in most cases, they, they get away with it because we are able you know, to do that. And then eventually someone most likely, you know, did something like that. Hopefully they didn't know, but in many cases you would tell me that they, they absolutely knew that they had COVID and they would just, you know, they don't care. They would ride the subway without a mask on, show up in the office without a mask, expose everybody. Well, eventually she got it and she died. And, uh, but that's okay because there's plenty of other nurses, right? You show up to the next nurse. And so like this idea of my brother's keeper is like the decisions you make have a direct impact on other, everybody else's life. I mean, not just the, your loved ones, but like everybody's life in ways that you sometimes can't even begin to imagine. And I don't understand why we're having such a difficult time understanding that. I'm not saying you need to go around and like give everybody you know, a $20 bill who asks for it or anything like that, but just a basic understanding that like, like we can only exist if we have take some level of care for each other and also for the other beings on the planet. Like if we just destroy the planet so that like all the fish die, uh, that's gonna be a problem for, it's like, it's a problem for everybody, but like people can't seem to grasp it. So, you know, like, so she's carrying a burden, like she's, she's carrying it, but they're like, the weight is, is, is a heavy weight and there's a lot of sadness there. It's almost like a responsibility and a responsibility that she's willing to accept, but at the same time is sad by accepting it because she knows A, that this is probably going to harm her and B, sad because she knows that people are actively trying to harm her and yet the only right decision she could make is to keep doing what she's doing, which is to help them, um, you know, which extends to lots of other people and including firefighters, social workers, including police, you know, I think, you know, this is the kinds of things of like, uh, we, and I, and I think it goes both ways, of course, with the, with the police too, like, you know, we're, we're our brother's keeper, you know, you don't, you can't, you can't deprive people of their civil rights. And simultaneously, we have to, you know, I, I don't know. It's like it's it. It seems like we, if we had a better grasp of this very simple concept of um, everybody is a human being, and we all have some basic level of responsibility to each other, then we wouldn't be in such a big mess in the environment with the political situation, you know. But but we don't. <laughs> no, yeah. it's all. Um, it it's important ideas to reckon with and they're uncomfortable. Um, but I think, you know, even if, I mean, of course, like cer those certain careers are, are really good examples of like, okay, there's immediate need to care for the other person, whatever they're exemplifying it professionally. But like with that person driving really fast down Broadway too, or any, or the person who holds the door for you, like you have a chance yeah. in every moment yeah. to perpetuate kindness and hope or to perpetuate frustration and anger and isolation and whatever you know feeling in that feelings wheel <laughs> you want to go for um exactly. that's, that's a cool privilege and responsibility so um yeah and i don't think it needs to be like you have to be some altruistic being of like i am going to hold doors for everybody and that's lovely I and mean, it's nice to do that but like just some sense that you like people who are acting like they like they don't have a responsibility to other people. And that, it, in my view, it, well, in, it simply isn't the case. Biologically, humans um, are um, social animals. We cannot live without other humans, period. And so this, this thing now where people are all like, I have the liberty to do anything I want, anytime, anywhere, for any reason, is just a preposterous thing. And it's leading, it's leading, well, this, 
I mean, you see it in lots of places, but you certainly see it in the United States. And we're, I mean, it's hard to not feel the burden of that as we just like basically spiral the drain as a nation, as a, I mean, so I'm wrestling with that, but like getting back to your original question is like, I don't, that is something that just, you know, I don't know how many paintings it's gonna take before I feel like I've gotten that out. The, the frustration, the anger, the disappointment, the sadness, um, trying to maintain like hope and resiliency, like still showing up like this figure, she's still showing up to do the work, even despite all those things, because what other option is there? You can't just give up either, you know? Right. Um, uh, yes. Um, and the fact that, you know, these small, like small set of colors, these few lines can tell that whole big story. Um, I think that's encouraging in itself. I love um, that that work achieves that thing. And there's one other thing I want to talk about for, you know, your process before we go into some of your actual like works that we have a slide for here. Um, I found you on Instagram, right? Because you have your tag early riser and I love that, that name. And I, I love the story behind it and that that's how you show up in the world of acting and, and, and artwork. Can you tell us about how you became early riser? <laughs> I I don't know that I have like officially became, it's just, <laughs> but I, uh, my uh, college, um, a very close friend of mine in college, like um, I, I had the habit of like waking up super early when everybody else would like pull an all nighter to get stuff done. Um, I just can't do that. Like I would go to bed like super early. Like I would call it quits by like 8 p.m. the day before a test, but then I'd wake up at like 3 a.m. to cram like and I still do that to this day if I've got like a big project that's due I'll, I the, I can't I just can't work for, I can't I need some break and I have to like stop it and then like restart again so like I would pretty much always like you know wake up at like two or three in the morning and then get into the studio or do and then to get the the thing done just in time, you know, just the way people would be like leaving. So it's funny because people would be like leaving the studio or leaving the library at three or four in the morning is like when I'd be coming in. And so um, I got coined early riser and it just stuck. But I think it's accurate because I, I really do feel energized. I'm definitely a morning person. I feel energized in the morning and things always seem the perspective is just different in the morning. And I love the concept of night hours. So when I say morning, I don't mean like bright sunshine, birds chirping. Like for me, morning is just the, uh, a term for like, a, 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 the, like, it's like powering down your computer and restarting it, you know, it's like a fresh start. And so like the morning could be pitch black and like, I still love the stillness of, of like the middle of the night and the, the way you can really get a lot of work done. But for me, I wanna like starting my day with that. It's just a brilliant, brilliant thing. Like ending it for me feels like a winding down, like you're winding down to this like inky quiet atmosphere. But like, I love the idea of, of waking up into it and you're waking up into total like silence when everybody is sort of asleep and not bothering you. And you can just wake up into a pure zone of productivity without, you know, other people hearing other people's alarm clocks go off or any of these things and it's dark and it's quiet and the world is at rest. And I love the idea that that's when you start your day. That's, um, it seems like a, such a special time. I can't say I do it very often, but, but um, when you're there, I, I, am, I can understand why that would be energy inducing or calmness evoking and kind of a little bit of everything in between. Yeah, I'm sure I got like a lot of that came from just you know, working on that boat since I was 14 years old because our shift started at 4 a.m. So um, I would have to wake up at three usually, um, never later than three anyway. And so I think that that just became the way I worked, you know. Wow, um, it all comes together. And so I'll pull up on the screen now some other ways um, your work and your essence come together in your street art here. So I don't remember if it was on your Instagram or in our conversations that you explained that you are an artist that puts stuff on the street. And I thought that phrasing was really um, special in itself, but I wondered if you could talk a bit about when you started putting art on the street and how that became a part of your repertoire. Um, you know, on and off, I've done it for 
a lot of lot long time, but I think with much more um, much more deliberately, probably five or six years ago. Um, you know, I just I think it probably with the rise of things coming more online and the things we discussed earlier with like people interact not interacting with the art in the real world ever, it started to really frustrate me. And I was trying to figure out without like how do you how can you get people to engage with the art in the real world? Um, and you know, Instagram is certainly you know, a way to reach a lot of people, but they don't interact with the art. They don't see it in, in person. And so you know, I think, you know, putting stuff on the street really is an outgrowth of that. I've been thinking about that for a very long time and how I could do that. Um, and so when I put stuff on the street, I'm really trying to bring my art and just put it on the street. I'm not trying to do something that's like, like this is an its own special thing, street art. I'm just trying to take the art that I have and get it to places where people are. And obviously there are some technical things that need to be different for it to survive being on the street. Uh, if you put a canvas up on the, on the corner, it would not last very long and also it would be probably taken right away. So like, that's why I stumbled onto doing these street signs, um, you know, which are essentially just very, very durable canvases. Um, but ironically, people do steal these too. Um, some of them, some people have gotten quite adroit at, at taking them very quickly. But, um, but anyway, so that you know, that, the kind of that's in a nutshell. One of the things I, I really, you know, I keep in mind is that for me, I, art is always a creative and additive process, and not a um, a destructive process. And so I. Um, I'm very careful to make sure that my art is not taking away from its environment or, or damaging in any, any significant way. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in um, uh, doing anything that can hurt um, the thing I'm, I'm putting my art on or I'm not interested in defacing people's property or anything like that. I, I, um, I try to limit the footprint, if you will, so that you can go camping and you can light a, you know, campfire and everything, but you're going to leave only footprints and you go. And so I sort of, um, you know, try to follow that model and, and use it in a non-destructive way of doing doing my art. Uh, yet, it has to be durable so that it lasts. It, um, so that's a challenge because you need to put something that's gonna last long enough for people to see it, but then also be not permanent in, in other ways. Um, so, uh, the, the signs are, are, are a good way to, to do that because, of course, they're, they're not permanently affixed to the poles in any way. And these signs are mine. I mean, I, they're mine. I, I purchased them. They're not city signs that I painted over. These are signs that I, I own. Um, and all I've done is temporarily affix them to the pole. They can be removed at any time. Um, I never get, I very rarely get back to take them down because they usually get um, taken by people, but sometimes I do. There are a few revolving ones. I go back and I take down and I put new ones up. That's awesome. I remember um, there's this this fun anecdote of you quasi stalking a sign crew to kind of figure out their means. What do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I came across one day a sign crew putting up signs. And so I, I sort of followed them to kind of see how they did it, like what tools they were using. Cause I, I mean, obviously you could do it with like, I don't know, like a hose clamp or something, but I knew that that's not what they used. And it's not also very like durable. I mean, they need to be able to basically, they have the same criteria that I do. They, they're not really trying to damage the poles. They need them to be durable enough to last through the snowstorms and whatever else and also not particularly easy for people to just take. So it's exactly the same set of parameters that I have for my art. So yeah, I followed them to see exactly, and also just the logistics of once you know what materials to use, how do they actually do it? You know, like there's a, a particular technique to sort of, you know, doing it with one person and how to do it to get to stay up there. And, and so I did, I stopped one kind of, I followed one down Broadway. They put up like five or six signs and I just kind of went along with them and um and watched so um, it's like an impromptu apprenticeship <laughs> it was. i mean 
And it was, yeah, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a hard thing to do, but it's helpful to watch somebody who does it all the time to see how to do it. Sure. I, <laughs> um, yeah. You had also, um, I really appreciated this chance that you gave me to learn about, you know, graffiti versus street art, that intent being an important differentiation for like um, legal purposes and stuff. And I had never even thought to be wary of that or cognizant of it. What is that about? Well, I mean, I don't want to get too hung up on that to like a, a real, you know, rabbit hole. I mean, it's hard to describe the differences between street art and graffiti. There are differences, um, but the legal thing is a separate issue. Uh, but the different, my opinion, the difference between street art, first of all, there, there's a lot of gray area between street art and, and, and graffiti. Um, some people would say that all of it's graffiti. Um, I, I would sort of in my mind categorize what you would call graffiti, I think it's more of a stylist. I think it has a lot more to do with the style. Style. It's like a stylistic term. Um, but I think, so I think there's a certain particular style that would fall more under graffiti than street art. And I think one of the key components um, besides the style is that um, the, you know, most frequently with graffiti, there's people are, are typically reproducing um, uh, one name or one image or one combination thereof. So they're sort of like trying to propagate their name or their their image and name and they're kind of to make a mark on the world, if you will. I think of it as like, you know, how can somebody who feels they have no voice or that they have, that they're, they're, the world is not allowing them to be memorable in any way, um, make a mark in the city, you know, when they are not being offered opportunity, when they, they feel like they are not, you know, being, you know, acknowledged as even being here. They're like, they're being marginalized or whatever. Well, one of the ways, one of the most simple ways to do it is literally to write on a wall, like I am here, my name, look me, I was here, here, here I am, I exist. And, and then of course, a much more elaborate version of that where highly stylized lettering and you know usually pseudonyms uh, or tags whatever you want to call them or handles uh, sometimes you know a sort of unique identifier that's an image um, but I think the that you know when I think of graffiti as a term I'm thinking of it as that like as a way to declare to the world that like here I am I exist um, and that's just my own personal, I don't want to step on other people's toes. And that's just my own kind of, if I had to try to find a way to separate street art from that. But then it's not to say that street artists aren't also saying, hey, here I am, I exist. Um, I think that street artists are going to be more focused on um, uh, propagating. You know, a lot of times street artists do borrow heavily from the graffiti and that they will use the same or similar images or at least um, a very similar style to kind of have brand continuity. But I think that the goal is more to say like, hey, I'm, I'm an artist, here's my art, notice me, as opposed to I exist, notice me. But then again, there's a lot of gray area between that. Yeah, but I think that's yeah. to um, like, you know, for like the historical context, it just, I, I really appreciate your perspective. Yeah, yeah. And then as far as like the legal things, that's a whole nother thing. I, I you know, we talked about that kind of offline. There's, um, it's, it's, I think it's worthwhile for anybody who does anything like this to be pretty knowledgeable about like how the law delineates. And I think the most interesting thing about, um, about it, and this really does relate. So some of the things that I think you cannot do anything in this country without thinking about race and how like there, in some respects, the, uh, the line between graffiti and street art is a little bit arbitrary. And, um, you know, graffiti, I think has, I, I think it's fair to say that has been predominated more by, by people of color and street artists have been predominated more by, um, um, by you know, Anglo, people, although there's a good mix, but I think, I think there's a socioeconomic angle to it. And for those reasons, street artists, street art in general tends to carry in many of the ways a less, this is what we were talking about, less serious criminal, criminal consequences uh, than graffiti does. 
what we're talking about specifically is intent. Um, what is your intent to dis deface or harm or hurt um, or, or uh, the, the, the thing? So what, or, or what was your intent in doing this? Was it just to deface it or was it, you know, some other sort of nefarious intent or something like that? That's going to weigh, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but that's going to weigh heavily against you as opposed to was my intent to exert my freedom of speech in showing the world my art. Mm -hmm. uh, if your intent was not nefarious, uh, the consequences legally are fewer. And so uh, the intent is very critical um, in, in the level of degree. Is it, a, is it a civil infraction? Is it a, you know, is it a is it a criminal? You know, is it a misdemeanor versus a felony? A lot of that has to do with the intent that you had. If you had absolutely no intent to harm anybody or anything, and your only goal was to get your art out there for people to see, uh, and no or a nominal amount of injury to a building or something has occurred, um, the likelihood of that resulting in like a serious um, um, you know, like a serious legal issue it, it is, is, is slimmer than a, a kid, you know, doing quote unquote graffiti uh, on a wall with a spray can. Right. And, uh, and so what we were talking about, and for my interest is the most interesting thing about that. And I think the most unfortunate thing is that Again, it really, I think, does just like we see with like the the, the Rockefeller drug law, law laws and things, where the, there would be heavier penalties for like people in possession of crack cocaine than than, in, than powdered cocaine. You know, again, so I think we can't look at this this question without also realizing that um, race, racial and discrimination, uh, unequal treatment under the law. Uh, pervades everything in our society, and and so too does this. The fact that the stuff I do would most likely be called street art, um, be given an understanding that the intent was uh, not nefarious, and for those reasons, be um, dealt with probably less heavily. Um, and again, speaking very broad, uh, I think is is uh, versus somebody who is doing ostensibly the same exact. Thing, but um, maybe with you know a slightly different intent of just putting their name on a wall, now would carry a much more serious, you know, um, penalty potentially. And um, if you really looked at the demographics, and I don't have them in front of me, but if you pull the demographics of like, you know, the, the arrests versus actual charges, and then versus convictions, and also then what the penalties were for like street art versus like different things, I think you would find that like, I'm certain you would find that the it racially breaks down, it's, it's harming communities of color more. Yeah, part of our, um, you know, charge as social workers is to be both in that direct practice world and also in that more macro like research world that, that tells the story of, you know, systemically what's going on. And so I think you're inspiring me to, to figure out where that data is. And I mean, and tell it's that story. Tricky because I don't want to, you know, it's hard to talk about because obviously race is something that's hard to talk about in our country. And also to acknowledge it's hard when you're at the other side of that privilege to talk about it. So I think it's it's important for somebody like me to acknowledge the privilege that I that I have. Um, and so that I, I, I'm aware that um, that I'm treated differently in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of the public, you know, that most people that are graffiti artists, especially younger one, the ones that kind of the graffiti artists that have blurred, blurred the line and become sort of street artists, as traditional artists, they kind of start to fall into my world, but the vast majority of them aren't doing these kinds of interviews, not being asked to do these things and not being, so I'm very, very aware that I've been given all these privileges for no other reason than I, you know, am white and have been brought up with a certain socioeconomic background, things like that, that I comes with resources. And, you know, I've family members who are lawyers that could teach me about all these interesting things and all that. And, and so I'm, I'm benefiting from 
you know, systemic racism, and I'm also benefiting from, uh, you know, generational, um, you know, actual wealth and also sort of intellectual or intellectual is not the right word, uh, but accrued like knowledge wealth sort of from, you know, being afforded, if you're afforded more opportunity, you know, uh, genera generationally, you're gonna have more access to resources, you know, right? So, um, so I think it's important. When going you, there with me, yeah, that is a really- I think it's important to, to, I do think it's important to talk about how race can affect things. Like why do we even have two separate terms? So I, I mean, I do think they are distinct things, but I also think it's interesting as to who engages in what and, and particularly how the penalties for one versus the other. I mean, there are certainly ter certain types of street artists that could probably get an equal penalty for the same. It depends on what you were doing, but I could, I, without even having this directly in front of me, I could say for sure, the people that were picked up for doing street art, if we were to look at 500 cases and look at 500 cases of people that were picked up for graffiti, that I, and you look at what it all boiled down to, what, what happened to those people, as a, as a group, the 500 who were picked up for street art would have gotten a whole lot, lot lighter. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for talking me um, through that and thinking about it with me. And the last thing I wanted to know about this one more from like in your head, is this person part of a scene in the same way that your painted work on canvas is, or is, is this inspired by a different sort of thought process? No, it, de it definitely is. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, you could project whatever you want into it, but you know, she's ringing and this is, this would be more, this would fall into the more happy, less, burden sort of image, I suppose, which is not so characteristic for me. People love this one. People love happy, especially in the pot in this, again, the, in the pop art world or the the quick soundbite world, people love the happy stuff. They don't have to think too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's ringing a doorbell with flowers behind her back. So there, you know, you could- A nice surprise, hopefully. <laughs> projective, whatever you want to do. Why she's wearing a bathing suit, I don't know. Um, just because I'm not interested in, I'm not really interested in drawing clothes usually. So, but I didn't want it to be nude. <laughs> That's a good compromise then. Um, uh, but, but if you look in the sign, the sign says lost behind her. So. Oh, wow. Right That's so cool. Ah. Yeah. Um, here's another, um, just kind of, I just pulled some, some ones that stood out to me um, at first glance. And I loved that there were, um, words accompanying, accompanying this art too. I wondered if you could um, speak to any of them that maybe are speaking to you more right now than, than the others. Um, yeah, I like to, I, I often in, in incorporate words. And again, that gets maybe back to like, I do think in these, these scenes. And so often that accompanies that as dialogue. Um, well, I focus on the no one's free until everyone's free thing, I think. Um, uh, that's an image of the I bite racist and the I bite racist too. It's just like a, a dog and it's little dog brother. Um, that was a, uh, the dog, the, so the dogs are both um, special needs dogs. So we wouldn't particularly know that, but um, that was, so that piece I put up as a placeholder for a much more provocative piece that I did uh, involving the murder of George Floyd, but I was told by the curator to not put that one up till like the day before the presidential election because he was afraid that it would be um, defaced mm. and but he wanted it to be up for the election. So we put this up and I and, uh, and I had already done this no, I bite racist and I bite racist two piece. Uh, so I just put that up there because I do I think it's a, I like the image and I like the meaning. And um, but eventually it was going to replace with this murder of George Floyd piece. Um, and the murder of George Floyd piece had as its background, no one is free till everyone's free. And I think, you know, that's a, a, a again, it's this brother's keeper concept, this idea that like, you know, we're not different. We're not, humans are all the same. We have different families. We come from different cultural backgrounds. Sure, all those things. And yet, 99.999% of our genes are the same. 99.99% of our experiences are the same. We have the same emotions. We have families that, we, I mean, it's all the same. And again, we can't exist without each other. So I can't, 
like, like, like it's incumbent upon me to talk about this. So if I am we're talking about how I'm a person who's experienced more privilege and I've and I've also experienced marginalization. I mean, I'm I'm um, I'm queer. I'm lesbian, and so I've I've certainly, you know. Uh, know what it's like to feel marginalization, although that's handy that you can sort of only, you can hide that when you want to, which is nice, but I know what it feels like, but I do, you know, acknowledge that there's a lot of um, privilege that I've been provided, and I think that what comes with that is the responsibility then to, to speak up in ways that you can, uh, and also to be aware of the implicit biases that we all have and things like that. So like, I think it's just so important to like, to, to call things out, like, you know, like there's no way I can comfortably exist on the planet knowing that somebody like George Floyd can't, you know, go to the store and like, get like I think about what would happen like, I mean, I, there, I think we've all experienced the time where like we've been given, like we're looking through our wallet and we're like, wait, this bill looks funny. You know, like, oh, this, I remember getting a $20 bill one time and I was like, this looks really shady to me. My first thought was I better just go spend it quick, you know, get it out of here, right? Like, I don't know, I was given it as change and I just use it again. That's exactly what George Floyd did, right? And, and he was murdered for it. I um, mean, and, and at least, you know, there were, you know, consequences for the, the person that, that did that. Um, but I think we know that there is a systemic problem. There's a system that encourages that to happen and more often than not allows people to get away with it. And I think, so how come I can have a totally different experience when that happens to me and nobody would ever even think of calling the police about it, no less would I get murdered over it, you know? And like, that doesn't make it not my problem. It's 100% my problem. Like, because like, I don't have to think back too far. I am Polish, um, uh, you know, I'm queer as I mentioned. And like, it's only an, an, a whole branch of my family who, well, one branch like left Europe just in time and one branch didn't. And they were all like, um, they were all gassed in Auschwitz. And so you don't have to go back too far to find a place where you have you, you know, we've all been other to the point of, you know, either been deprived liberty or ability to thrive or grow or actually being killed. And so I think you, we, it's, I, I, so that's a very important piece for me because I, I, it's basically, you know, me saying that like, when this happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. And, and the people that have them have greater, you know, privilege and also likely less repercussions when they go out on the street and, and you know, protest and raise are the, exactly the people that should yell the loudest, I think, or at least, you know, uh, at least be out there yelling or doing work that I think, um, I don't know, it's, it's just so, I just can't get, I can't get it out of my head that we're all, we're all equal, we're all the same people and it matters what happens to you. It matters what happens to everybody I pass on the street. I mean, I can't, you know, again, I can't, I can't do everything on the micro level, but I have to, I think, you know, I, it, it bothers me that as a society, we can't just understand that like it, and you know, that we, we're all in, like, we're all in this together. We're all, you know, so that's what that piece is about. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, I um, you know, I first discovered your work somewhere in the East Village, I think, or Alphabet City, and it was a series of of these of dogs. And I see that there's animals in a bit of your work that is out in the world. Um, is there? Um, have you always had had pets? Is there a reason that this is something that's important to you? I don't know the dogs. I mean, uh, animals are meaningful to me uh, artistically. Uh, I think because they, so, well, a couple, for a couple of reasons. They, they exhibit pure emotion without any artifice. So like getting back to our whole thing with like Instagram, how you could be literally on the verge of self-harm because you're in this terrible relationship, but you're still gonna post this like, everything is wonderful picture. 
and not even like realizing that that's not your reality. Like you'd rather maintain this artifice than actually change your situation. And also by you posting that, you're probably harming the people that are seeing it. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's all this extra stuff that gets layered on top that makes, makes it very hard to really access true human emotion. But animals, is, it's not the case at all. Like whatever emotion is there, is there, you know? And um, I love that about them. Um, if there's no, they don't hide anything if they're, you know, upset or if they're happy or it just, it's right on the surface. And then the, particularly I started like with the dogs, they're really almost all special needs dogs. And um, because I'm not, it's not all doom and gloom. I, 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 I'm inspired by, resiliency and by determination and I look at like I look at special needs dogs particularly I, I have a special needs dog that like I live with and um he just keeps trying like he he can't go up steps because his back legs are paralyzed but he, every single day he still tries to go up the steps like he forgets that he you know and like that's like an, and uh, so I, I mean, that's, that's incredibly inspiring. And so I love the idea of working with a, you know, an animal that can simultaneously express these pure unmasked emotions and at the same time be um, com completely willing to never give up so that it can, it can be uh, expressed utter sadness or utter, utter fear and yet still be willing to try like a dog that's been beaten like which is a terrible thing of course will still try to you know no, like will still try to to make a new human friend you know it, which is mind-boggling to me but I think we can learn a lot from it and I so I like I think it's an easy it's almost like a cheater access into emotions the animals that's um, so valid and so inspiring. And so thank you for um, talking me through, you know, what that means to you. So we talked about one of these, but I wonder then maybe we can just focus on the one that's on the left side with the blue background and what was um, going on here, or how this came to be. Uh, you know, again, it's sort of the, the, so the, you could project a lot of different things onto the person. It's not even really clear if it's a man or a woman, which was intentional. Um, you can't really tell if they're like, they have a Fendi bag, which I tried to render well enough that you could tell it was a Fendi bag, but the rest looks maybe like it could be somebody who's like wearing, you know, secondhand or found clothes. And are they tired? Are they lost? Are they, you know, are they just thinking? You don't know, but like the dog seems to know you know, so like, again, I'm using the dog as a way, as a mirror into, and the dog feels like, again, like the dog is worried about the situation. Like the dog is like, they're, we're, not in, we're not in a good place, but yet is there, is showing up. It's like, well, I guess the only thing I could do is be present for this person. Like, again, I'm, I'm your brother's keeper. I and mean, like dogs get that. Like I'm showing up here. Like, I don't know if this is going to be okay. I don't know if we have a place to stay tonight, but I'm here with you we're going to experience it together and um so i don't know you can really you can imagine any scenario but i think that those are the those are the kinds of things i i think about when i when i look at it and i i hope that it brings out to other people that there's a lot of emotions happening and um but the the dog i think represents the resiliency but also uh, a sense of responsibility to the other person, but also a, a very, um, a very vivid mirror into the emotion. I mean, the dog has a fully rendered face with very clear emotion, whereas the, the human doesn't. Um, so that we're really relying on the dog here to kind of share the, what le how concerned should I be? Is this a happy person? Are they just sleeping? Well, you look at the dog and you know that, no, the, there's something that's off. Yeah, I think that that duality and like the resiliency and responsibility are a really, um, I think to me, one of the biggest takeaways from this conversation and this work um, that we've got to 
to look at uh, today. So as we start to wrap up and abstract from these um, specific, you know, art pieces to the bigger picture, I would love to understand more about, you know, why for you does art matter? What keeps inspiring and motivating you in this world that's so far from where we want it to be? I mean, why does art, ha, ha, I, I can't envision a world without art. I think um, on a personal level, it's the only thing that has ever been successful in keeping me from completely falling into despair. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I can't function like without art. I can't without doing art, without being creative. It's, it's any time that I start to get really sort of noticeably despairing or sad, like to the point that like somebody will call me out on it. Like my mother will be like, you know, like calling her in the middle, not in the middle of the night, literally, but like late at night, you know, being so sad about whatever, you know, the state of our democracy or you know, like the fact that it looks like Ukraine will be invaded or any of those things. And like, it, it seems like that's getting, like I'm getting more and more like that, more and more like pessimistic, more and more despondent. Her first thing is always like, uh, have you been getting to the studio lately? You know, like she's always checking in to make sure I've been like doing art, you know? And nine times out of 10, it's been times where I've been super busy doing other things that I haven't been able to devote. I mean, I, I'm in the studio every single day but I, you know, some, sometimes I'm not working as hard and then it seems to reflect in my, my mood. So it's my form of therapy. And uh, so that's on a personal level, but on a societal level, I think arts function is to, is, is to connect us all. I mean, I think there are very few other things in our world that still bind us together in the same way that art does. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I look at my friends, uh, the community of artists, they span generations, they span races, cultures, um, and where we all speak the same language of art. And music is the same thing, or there's many other types of, but, you know, art and, uh, uh, it, it, you know, music, dance, theater, it, it, these are ways that we can connect to the human experience. And, and, uh, and they, they cross all, all barriers, you know, I think, really like languages don't do that like uh you know our ways of like fashion doesn't do that like there's very few things that really can honestly reach just like everybody but i could take art i could take music i, I think i could probably take it on a spaceship go to another planet when we find life and i think it would mean something to those those beings that we found you yeah. know so uh, that's why I think it means, that's why I think it's important on the, on the macro level. Thank you. And so, um, you know, in um, these experiences you've had and what you continue to, to do and contribute to the world, are there any lessons you've picked up along the way or wisdom that you would share that, that has meant a lot to you or that you think others could benefit from? Um, I mean, I don't know how much wisdom I have. I make a lot of mistakes, um, but mistakes are important. Like, don't be afraid to you have to make mistakes in order to get better. So um, like 99% of getting good at something is doing things badly. Um, so I, I, I encounter a lot of people that are afraid to make a mistake. And so they just only do things they think they won't make a mistake at. And then that's just, um, you won't go anywhere in my opinion. And then the other thing is that you have to do you have to work at everything. Like just because you have talent as an artist doesn't mean that you're a good artist. All it means is that you have the prerequisites to be a good artist. And then it takes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And you have to be painting or drawing or exercising your art every single day forever, basically. I mean, you can take a vacation once in a while, but <laughs> mostly you have to do the art. You have to do it. Um, it's not like you've just been given this talent and now you just, you, it's just there for whatever you need to access it. If I don't use it uh, very quickly, it gets rusty and then the, the work isn't as good anymore. And then I've got to build it back up again. So yeah, um, do stuff even if you think you're not going to be good at it. Expect to make mistakes. Most everything will be a mistake and only occasionally will something not be a mistake. And then 
Um, and then just like literally work really hard at it. Like every single day you have to, with art, you have to do it every single day. Writing also, like you have to write every day in order to be any good at it. Yeah, they're both um, hard truths, but they are complete truths. And, and people, we need to always come back to them and have that kind of like splash the water in our face moment. Like, yeah, we do have to put the work yeah. in to see anything. Job, you know, it's like a job, like anything, you, just, yes. you know, yeah, you get better and better and better, but you have to do it. Absolutely. Um, so I love that. And finally, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and about your work? And what are you looking forward to right now? Um, oh, I don't know. I, I think I've said everything. People can kind of reach their own conclusions. Um, but what am I looking forward to? Um, I have a new, uh, there's a, a, a television pilot in production that I, I'm looking forward to, which is, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's a sci-fi involving aliens that are, that live on the earth that are being traded by rich people in exchange for like sexual favors and things. It's really interesting. And then um, I'm also going to be doing like a very large mural. We haven't found the exact location yet, but it's going to be probably a two or three story mural. Um, that dog that said, uh, I am strong. Unfortunately, that dog passed away recently. And he was such an inspiration. He's helped so many other special needs dogs. He, he became kind of a, a celebrity I and mean, he had like hundreds of thousands of followers. And so I can't even tell you how many uh, dollars have been raised because of that dog or how many other dogs have been adopted because of him. But anyway, I'm going to be painting like a very large mural of him in the Lower East Side. It'll be at least a two story, maybe a three story mural. We're still, we're still negotiating the, the space for it. But so I'm really looking forward to that because that, that, uh, that's, a, that's personal for me, you know, that, that particular dog. I wouldn't have my dog if it wasn't for, his name is Oscar. I wouldn't have my dog if it wasn't for Oscar. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be so great. I can't wait to visit home and, and see your work up there. And it will mean even more to me now that I get to, to know you and your work and your motivation. So um, this has meant so much to me. I'm so appreciative, Early Riser. I'm so excited to share your story. Um, thank you so much for being here. Oh, sure. Thank you.